Okay, I'll call this meeting in order and welcome to the February 28th uh, City Council informational meeting. It's good to have everybody here today and uh, welcome council members. Uh, the first item is a report from the Land Use Committee that met last Tuesday, February 21st. Uh, Shannon Burhay, Assistant uh, City Engineer, updated us on both the Accessible Sidewalk Engineering de Design Standards and Chapter 26 ordinance changes. Some of the topics that he covered included background, accessible sidewalk, Chapter 16 overview, um, dual curb ramps, sidewalk width and passing area, uh, more on design detail, accessible sidewalk ordinance changes, uh, and then we also discussed uh, implementation, communication, and education strategies. And then the committee followed up with some discussion on the communication finds dual curb ramps, intersection design and responsibility and the implementation timeline along with uh, permitting. Uh, following uh, no open discussion, the meeting was adjourned. Anybody wish to add anything from that particular committee? Okay, moving on to item uh, n number three then. Uh, City Council open discussion. Do we have any open discussion this afternoon? Councillor Erpenbach. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, thank Councillor Starr. Um, Councillor Neitzert and I joined Councillor Starr yesterday at, was it yesterday? Yes. At, <laughs> sorry, losing track of time. Um, we visited uh, Safe Home, and I actually hadn't been in it since it was under construction. And just a reminder uh, about Safe Home, it is a county project that the city made a contribution to, but, but it is, um, it follows that model of housing first for the most chronically homeless in the community. I very often hear people say, you know, they'll see something on the internet about the housing first model, and gosh, we should do that in Sioux Falls. And I always say, and we already have, yay. But um, it was great to tour it and see how it's um, working out. It's full all the time. And, and uh, there are 33 um, people living there who are, again, chronically homeless for various reasons. The other topic that came up yesterday during that conversation was um, the idea of breaking the cycle of homelessness, the generational cycle that really does make a, an impact on, um, on a person's well-being over the length of their life. Many of those folks who are, are chronically homeless have been so since childhood in various ways, shapes, or form. And one of the things we talked about then was another buzzword, rapid rehousing, which is a federal mandated program. And we're also doing that in Sioux Falls. And I just wanted to remind folks, uh, Heartland House is our new rapid rehousing program. So we are doing some amazing things in terms of those folks who are the, among the least and the lost in our community. And I just wanted to, again, thank Councillor Starr for organizing that for us and I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, and that is an important aspect of, I might just add, because of one forgotten factor in homelessness is often the children. And because we do have a large number of homeless children in our community, and as a teacher in the public school system, um, I dealt with a number of them personally, and it was pretty difficult to expect them to turn in a biology homework assignment when they didn't know where they're gonna live that evening. So it is, it is something that needs to be addressed. Thank you very much for your efforts. Councillor Staley. Um, I've asked uh, attorney David Fifley to come up today uh, because I wanted to, I, I thought it would be beneficial for us to have a discussion as a group about what happened last week at public input when we were discussing um, when to end public input. And we also had an instance where a council member objected to a testimony that was being given by a citizen. And I also want to talk about heralding back to when um, Councillor Starr was asking to have a, a citizen testify when we were talking about Wiley's and the mayor made a ruling, well, I don't, or he made a decision not to let us um, have a, a citizen come up. So I think moving forward, we all need to be on the same page as to what the procedure is um, for addressing those things when they arise. So, um, Mr. Fifley, would you come up, please? And, and the first thing I, I wanted to talk about was I, I have this, and I don't, you don't have this. Did you? Um, um, and I handed this out. This is out of our operations manual. But, and I've, I've had this since I was elected, um, but it says any member of the council may call on a citizen to provide additional public testimony. 
So I, first of all, need to know how that gets implemented, and then if we could talk about some of those other things I just mentioned. Thank you, Councilor. I think I have uh, the gist of your questions. Uh, Dave Fifely with the City Attorney's Office. Briefly, uh, what you're referring to is in the Council Procedures Handbook, and that's taken from Ordinance Section 30.015, and this is for the citizen's benefit. Uh, Part A talks about public input at the beginning of a meeting, and 30.013, I think it's Part G, talks about you know, that general public input that we have at the beginning of a meeting that is on an agenda item. So then uh, 30.015 talks about during public input portion at the start of a city council meeting, uh, no person shall be permitted to speak on, the, on a topic that appears later in that meeting's agenda if public input will be received when that agenda item is up for discussion. So I think that does that answer kind of your first question as far as when public input is appropriate in terms of if it is an agenda item later on in the council meeting, they need to wait until <clears throat> if there's public input at that item, say as a second reading of an ordinance or a resolution or an alcohol item that's on the regular agenda, then they would need to wait until that particular item. Right, but how about, the, I'm talking about the last sentence there. So if I would like to call a citizen to provide additional testimony. How does that look? Uh, in terms of How that, does that same, play out? in terms of that t same ordinance I was talking about, Part E talks about that no person, other than the city council and the person having the floor, shall be permitted to enter into the discussion. So again, a council member could call someone up during that general public input. However, I would caution against it, and I'll make this very public. When we, by the South Dakota Open Meetings Commission rules and those state statutes, we set forth an agenda in advance, and that is a proposed agenda. Of course, things can happen where things may change slightly, but the concern is always if there is a back and forth going on between you as elected officials and a citizen during that general public input does it become an agenda item on that specific topic that should have been noticed? This has been discussed over the years with the council, and some of you uh, more veteran uh, members can probably recall that, that we need to be careful, and certainly we talked about this as you were coming on board too, Councilor, that you need to be careful in terms of that back and forth or that colloquy, I think as they call it, where you don't want to create that back and forth discussion because suddenly it can become a specific agenda item that maybe should have been noticed. We don't want to risk a violation of the open meetings law. Well, and I, I read that more to, to relate to, um, <clears throat> like if we were, we were um, well, I'll just take it to the public input instance last, let, let's go back to last week. Okay, uh, Councilor uh, Chair Ralphing wanted to close public input and I wanted to allow more people to testify. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I call out for a point of order. Was that, was that the right thing to do? Yes, ma'am, that was the correct thing. Okay, and then um, he's, he made a ruling not to let it continue, and then Councillor Starr made a motion to, to vote on, appeal. To, to appeal his decision. Correct. Now, could I, have made the, uh, could I have made a motion initially? Do you have to do the point of order first? Yes. Yes, that was all done properly, Councillor. You, you make the point of order first, give the chair a chance to consider it. If you want to appeal the decision of the chair, and that's being the mayor or the acting mayor at, in the middle chair there, and then by a majority vote of the rest of the council, you can overrule the ruling of the chair on a point of order. So I, I could have made that motion to appeal myself as well. You just Correct. need to have a second on it. Right, but I, I think you were appropriate there, Councillor, because you were asking first for the chair to essentially reconsider their ruling and say, wait a minute, I think we should allow that public input to continue when the chair's ruling was adverse to what you wanted. Councillor Starr was proper in saying, you know, appealing it and then a majority vote could override the decision. Okay, th okay. now, this is, so then now another council member 
uh, we had t during public input, uh, a citizen was referencing a public employee. A <coughs> council member objected to the to the content of that, and it it ended. Now I'm thinking, let's say that ha that happens, and and I think they should continue. So we have one council member with one opinion, another council member with another opinion. At that point, should I have asked, called for a point of order, or do I go right for a motion to? You could ask for a point of order, and then again, there could be a motion to appeal the decision of the chair if the chair wanted it to discontinue. Uh, the other ordinances section, I can't cite it off memory, but there is an ordinance that talks about naming people specifically versus addressing the council as a body or naming specific individuals and engaging in slanderous remarks towards an individual by ordinance that says that should not be done. But I think that refers to council members and the mayor. I don't know that it does that it also envelop city employees. I don't have the I, I, right in front of me, okay. Councilor, but I believe it would count as public okay. employees as well. All right. And then the third example was when we were dealing with the Wiley's uh, liquor licensing issue, um, Councilor Starr wanted to have a citizen come up and testify, and the mayor said no. So I, that would that be the same play out that we call for a point of order and then let him decide, and then you go to the motion to appeal after that? Correct. Right? So that's kind of going to be our yes. standard. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Could, could I just... I'm mm. sorry. Yes. Could, could I just ask one follow-up question? <clears throat> that, that was all very clarifying. I appreciate it. So that last sentence about any member of the council may call on a citizen. So to be really clear, um, that would be best used at an actual agenda item that's been noticed. You know, I, I ask, I want some developer to come up to give a little more clarity on some question or... Yes, you know, counselor. But the, the danger with public input is I call on somebody and say, hey, why don't you come up and talk about this rezoning item coming up in three weeks? we may start engaging in that back and forth and now we've committed possibly an open meetings violation. That's the possibility that we're trying to avoid. You have it exactly correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion on that particular topic? Hey, Councillor Staley? And, and then I had just had one more comment to make. Um, I, I was made aware today that we there is a possibility of forming a task force that would uh, study annexation for citizens in our community. And I just wanted to be on record stating that I would hope uh, that included in that task force would be some of the residents slated to be annexed who would be adversely affected by that, by the, the burden of the financial um, costs that would be added to that. Yes, thank you, Councillor Staley, for your comments. And I can assure you that is already a planned part of the process and in fact we're even trying to expand that even maybe a little further if possible based on suggestions. Any other comments? Councilor Erickson. Thank you, I'll be brief. Um, I just wanted to inform the council um, that I was asked to sit on a um, group slash task force if you will um, alongside with the county in regards to the triage center and just opportunities to discuss. There's been um, many people, many stakeholders meeting for several, several months and um, they've now developed a larger group to discuss this. Um, they were granted some um, grant money from, I believe it was the MacArthur Foundation. Um, we have a, a researcher from Augustana who's going to be compiling lots of data and lots of information from the jail to the penitentiaries to the hospitals and all of those kinds of things. And so um, if you have any questions, comments, I will certainly provide you updates as we meet um, and move forward and any uh, potential suggestions that are coming forward. There are several people within the administration as well that are sitting on this task force um, from Jill Franken and some of her staff as well of, as Chief Burns um, and his staff. So. Feel free to reach out anytime you have questions. We meet about monthly right now is what, what the plan is. So thank you. You bet, thank you. Any other items for open discussion? Okay, seeing none, then we'll move into our presentations. First up, we have Sioux Falls Parks and Recreation Fee Ordinance Updates by Alicia Luther, our rec manager, and uh, also Karen Leonard, I'm not sure if I, if, if Karen Leonard is gonna present or not, but Deputy C C uh, City Attorney presentation. So, we are ready whenever you are, Alicia, take your time. 
Well, good afternoon, counselors. Alicia Luther, Recreation Manager, Parks and Recreation. Um, today I'm going to share with you some information on possible amendments to the fee ordinance. Um, you all received a packet with information, um, both the marked up version of the ordinance and also a clean version and the PowerPoint for today. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to let you know that this is just general housekeeping information um, that we'd like to update with the ordinance. Um, nothing major for changes to this ordinance at this time. So an overview, as you will see as we keep moving forward um, through the presentation, we do not propose any rate changes for our current fee structure um, that we do have in place. Um, we will be discussing a couple of different definition changes or additions, one of which will be the annual aquatic season pass definition, and then also adding in a veteran pass definition. And then in addition, we will talk through um, adding in an annual veteran pass. So to begin with the definitions, as you can see, currently in our ordinance, we do have an annual aquatic season, and that is defined as um, effect, shall be effective from May 1 through April 30th of each year, and it'll include admittance to the Midco Aquatic Center, outdoor aquatic centers, and also the outdoor swimming pools. What we are proposing as a change to this definition would be that we would like to see the definition change to shall be effective from date of purchase for one 12 month period. Um, this pass would still remain effective at the Midco Aquatic Center, outdoor aquatic centers, and also the outdoor swimming pools. The reason for this change that we're proposing is that we have been receiving feedback from the public. As we've been living the fees, um, what we've noticed is that between January to now, we've seen a reduction in the number of passes that we're selling, whether it be fall, winter, spring, or the annual passes based on the value that they have. Um, if you buy it in January, it's going to expire in April, so a lot of people are saying, gosh, I don't really want to buy an annual pass, or I don't really want to buy a fall, winter, spring. And this would be something that would allow them to be able to purchase it um, you know, whenever, and then it would be good for 12 months, which we've heard a lot of great feedback from the public that this is what they would like to see and I think it would add a lot of value to that pass. In addition, we, um, as we looked through the definitions in the ordinance, we saw that there was not a definition for a veteran, and so we would like to include that in the definitions that we have in place. And so an individual who has or is currently serving the United States military must provide documentation of service, such as a military ID. Um, and again, that was just something that was originally not included in our definitions in the ordinance, so we would like to have that in there as we do have veteran passes. In addition, as we were reviewing the um, fee structure and then also um, from input that we've received and inquiries from the general public, as you know, we do have a fall, winter, spring, and also a summer veteran pass. Um, and the rates for those are the similar to what the senior citizen rate is or a reduced income adult. Um, unfortunately, we do not have a veteran annual pass included in the current rate structure. And so um, what we would like to do is add a veteran annual pass to the fee structure so that um, a veteran can come in and get a discount on an annual pass as well as those fall, winter, spring, and the summer passes as well. I wanted to briefly go over a timeline for you and let you kind of know where we've been and where we'd like to go with this. Um, we did meet with our Parks and Recreation Board last week on February 21st. Um, and the Park Board did recommend approval to the City Council for um, the updates that we are proposing. Um, we're here today to share this information with you, and then we would like to be coming back on March 7th for the first reading of this, and then on March 14th for the second reading. And then our goal would be to have these new rates go into effect by April 7th. Um, as you were able to see in the original definitions, all of our passes do expire on April 30th, so we would like to get this in place before those passes would expire. So with that, I would open it up to any questions that you may have. And before we do, I think I'll just, if I can correct something, mm -hmm. uh, there's no rate changes, so it, it's the, the updated ordinance would go into effect on April 7th. There aren't any rate changes going into effect? Correct. Okay. Counsel, Councilor Neitzer. Yeah, uh, thank you. This is good stuff. I, I, the same as, as you, I've heard some commentary that I'd, I'd really like to get a pass. I just... You know, I, I don't feel like I'm going to get the full value because it expires at a certain time. So this is good. Um, just a few operational questions. Um, 
do you send out a reminder? I, this is my first year. I got, I got for, the, for the same annual reason, I just got the fall, winter, spring mm -hmm. because of the prorate issue. Um, do you send out a reminder when, when once, or will you start doing that now to say, hey, it's time to renew? Absolutely. We will be sending out an email blast to all of our current pass holders and anybody that we have in rec track. Um, our online registration system as well so that we can remind people who maybe haven't purchased that that is coming up. We've been holding off on that just because we wanted to bring this to the council to see if we can get these changes to go through prior to sending out any information. Okay, and then for if I'm an annual pass holder, um, have you considered um, offering, and maybe you do already, offering to somebody an automatic renewal? We have discussed that, and we're looking through our system that we have in place on how we could do some of those different things. Um, we do have a robust online software system, and it's capable of a lot of different things. We just are trying to work through all of those different features that we can enable. Okay, and then finally, so the, the pro rate is on the, the annual, but I, I assume the others aren't changing. If I'm mid-flight and I get the fall, winter, spring, it, it just runs through the normal date. Correct. We would not be prorating any other of the passes. Okay, thank you. Any other comments or questions for Alicia? Okay, I just, uh, real quick on your online, uh, do you have the capability currently for online sign up and payment? We do, um, and so for anybody who purchases at a regular price, they are able to renew online for their passes. Um, we, if you are coming in for a reduced income or a free, we do ask that you do come in in person just so that we can verify that you're still currently receiving the active benefits um, that qualify you for those passes. But otherwise, if you did purchase at regular price, you're able to do it from the ease of your home. Great. Alicia, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the concerns of some of our citizens on that topic. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. Okay, the next uh, item on our agenda, next presentation is 2016 year-end financial report by uh, Director of Finance, Tracy Turbat. Welcome, Tracy. Thank you, and good afternoon. Tracy Turbat with the Finance Office. <clears throat> Here on the 28th of February uh, with the 2016 uh, year-end review of our financial results. 2016 was uh, a good year, but certainly not a year without its challenges, uh, as we've been talking about for some months now. Um, as you'll, you'll see, and I think it'll be no surprise, the, the local economy continues to do very well, uh, and the city did end 2016 in very strong financial position. The, the numbers in the report that you received last week and that you'll see today, uh, I'd ask that you do consider those to be preliminary. We are currently in the middle of our 2016 audit. So when, until that audit is complete and the, and the audit report issued, uh, we won't consider those uh, numbers to be final. Today I want to, uh, uh, as I have in the past, review the economy, uh, talk about those 2016 financial results for our general fund, our capital program, and enterprise activities, that really covers uh, the lion's share of what we do. Uh, I've added some additional slides today, and I plan to spend a little more time on city debt, uh, and then we'll wrap it up with a, a quick look at uh, what we expect in 2017. So getting started, jumping into the, uh, the economic uh, review. Unemployment uh, just continues to amaze, I think. Uh, uh, we ended 2016 at a 2.4% unemployment rate in our local MSA, uh, well below uh, the national rate and, and a fair amount below the state rate as well. Uh, one thing I would point out, in 2016, we averaged about 145,500 people actually working in our uh, local economy. That's an increase of more than 4,700 over what we averaged in 2015. So we're seeing uh, a significant increase in the number of people working, as you might expect, with the, the population growth that we're experiencing. Over the last five years, we've added more than 17,000 people uh, working in the uh, Sioux Falls economy. Hmm. Building permit values, uh, total Total value of all permits issued in 2016 was uh, almost $702 million. That's up about 3.8%, or about $25 million or so over 2015. Both of those were uh, record years. We did see very strong increases in new construction in 2016 uh, over the previous year in both commercial and in residential. 
We did see a decline in the value of permits issued for additions and remodels, and many, many people consider that to be a sign of strength in our economy. When we start to see the additions and remodels uh, take on a, a larger presence, the overall permits issue that tends to indicate people are a little less willing to jump out and, and build something new. They're more inclined to uh, remodel or improve on what they have. So uh, it's not a, not a bad sign to see additions and remodels uh, decline from 16 or 15 to 16. Sales tax collections uh, this is something obviously we watch closely all year long. 2016 uh, growth over 2015 was 3.4%. Uh, this is the uh, rolling 12 month uh, picture that you see uh, every month throughout the year uh, does not include Department of Revenue audit collections. And that 3.4% growth rate in 16 compares with 5.7% growth that we had in 2015. Over the last three years, which are reflected on the on the graphic here, we've averaged growth of 4.7%. Now, on, on this slide, I did add January of 17. We've received the January uh, collection information. And you can see that has pulled our 12-month growth rate down to 2.5%. Um, so that is certainly a, a, a point of concern, uh, although it was not totally expected. When we look at the, at the data, the January information in 2016 reflected really the best month that we had all year last year. And so it, the bar was set pretty high for January, uh, and we weren't really expecting to see a significant growth in January. Uh, and in fact, we did not. So. Uh, we'll certainly, as always, keep a close eye on that growth rate and continue to uh, report out on that uh, uh, on a regular basis. Entertainment tax uh, looks very similar, although uh, growing at a little stronger rate. The 2016 growth was 4.8%. Uh, and again, with the January data has uh, been pulled back to 4%, still a, a very respectable uh, growth rate. The average over the last uh, three years has been... Uh, uh, about 6.6 percent. So our entertainment tax dollars have been growing pretty robustly for some time now. So jumping into the the actual 2016 financial results, I do want to cover, as I mentioned, the general fund, the capital program, provide a summary of that, our enterprise funds, and city debt. So uh, before I get into the general fund numbers, I do um, do want to remind folks that. Uh, just what's included in the general fund. Some folks that may be watching don't necessarily uh, understand that. This is our primary operating account for the city. Uh, it's, it uh, provides or covers the cost of providing police and fire services, parks and library services, street maintenance and snow removal, public health, and then of course our general government uh, expenses are covered within the general fund. So looking at the general fund revenue picture for 2016, uh, overall, we had $151 million in revenue in our general fund, and you can see the, the major uh, share of revenues there on the slide. Uh, that's, that $151 million is $2.5 million below what we had estimated when we adopted the budget for 2016. So uh, in, in terms of percentages, that's a 1.7% shortfall uh, compared to what we had budgeted. You can see sales taxes and property taxes uh, are far and away the largest uh, portion of our general fund revenues. In fact, those two things combined uh, account for more than 76% of the revenues in our general fund. So those are uh, really our, our bread and butter when it comes to providing all those basic city services. Sales tax revenue specifically uh, ended the year $2.4 million below what we had budgeted. So that's, I don't think, should be a surprise to anyone uh, given the conversation that we've had for uh, a number of months now. Charges for services, uh, that's primarily, uh, the largest share of that would be in our public health department where they are charging for many of the services that they're providing there. It also includes uh, charges for services or programs within parks, uh, fire department, as well as the planning department. And the license and permits revenue, uh, that's primarily uh, related to building permits. So you can see that's where the uh, uh, the largest chunks of the general fund revenues gener are generated. Looking at the general fund expenditures for 2016, uh, we saw total expenditures of $152.2 million, and that's $6.7 million less than what was budgeted, or 4.2% below the total budget. 
Now normally we do, uh, it, it's, it's always expected that we will finish the year under budget with expenditures. But legally we can't exceed our budget and so there are, there are always dollars remaining. Normally we would, uh, we would see one and a half to two percent left in our budget. This year we've seen, uh, as I say, uh, 4.2 percent. And that additional amount left on the bottom line in terms of our expenditure budget really reflects the response that we took uh, to the slower growth in sales tax revenues. And as you know, we started uh, responding to that uh, very early in the year. So proactive steps were taken to reduce spending. Uh, and we also got lucky, quite frankly, in terms of the weather. We had uh, limited snowfall toward the end of the year. Uh, certainly saved us some money. Uh, in addition, fuel costs throughout the year, uh, as well as natural gas costs, uh, were lower than what had been anticipated in the budget. The focus throughout uh, the management of the, the 16 budget was really on maintaining quality services. And you can see on the slide, uh, I mentioned the fuel and energy costs that accounted for uh, over a million dollars of the savings that we, we uh, ended up with on the bottom line. Uh, remodeling projects, we've talked about that. There was some remodeling plan for City Hall. We also were able to complete the Cayley Library project uh, well under budget. Uh, snow removal costs, uh, we left a million dollars in the snow removal budget. Certainly that was a, a, a result of the, the favorable weather we had uh, at the end of 2016. And then the workforce grants, I think, as you know, were uh, scaled back some uh, very early on in 2016. So all those things combined and, and really the balance of that 6.7 million is spread to uh, dozens of, of smaller things uh, that were, were uh, left unspent uh, within the general fund budget. A key uh, a management goal that we have every year, as you know, is to manage around for the general fund, that 25% uh, reserve target. That is uh, what we refer to as our available fund balance, sometimes called unreserved fund balance, or just plain uh, reserve. Uh, we began the year in 2016 with $43.6 million uh, in our available fund balance. Uh, after netting out what revenues came in and what expenditures we had, uh, we reduced that available fund balance by 1.2 million. There were some small changes in restricted amounts that are within our general fund. So when everything was said and done, we uh, saw a decrease to our available fund balance of $1.4 million, leaving us $42.2 million as an available fund balance at the end of 2016. When we compare that to the total 2016 budget that uh, translates to a, a reserve of 26.5%, so we're 1.5% above that 25% policy target. Taking a, a further look at the change in the available fund balance or general fund reserves, uh, we originally budgeted when the budget was adopted to use 5.4 million. We certainly didn't uh, expect, uh, even in the, uh, if things had tracked uh, according to plan in terms of revenues, we would not have used 5.4 million uh, because we, as I mentioned earlier, we always leave some money unspent in the budget and so we don't ever use as much reserves as we budget to use. So when we did uh, adopt the budget, we were expecting to use $3 million in reserves by the time the year was over. Last fall in October, we provided you with an updated forecast of that, and at that time we were still projecting to use about $3 million of our available fund balance. And as I showed you on the previous slide, the actual use of fund balance uh, when everything was said and done was $1.4 million. So we we ended uh, better than we had, in terms of the reserves used, than what we had originally forecast, and certainly what we had uh, provided you as an updated forecast last fall. Historically, you can see on the, on the slide there from 2010 through 2016, uh, if you add all those numbers up, you'll see that a total of $1.1 million has been added to the available fund balance uh, since the beginning of 2010. The actual use you see in 2015 and 2016, uh, where we have actually uh, used some of our fund balance, uh, was forecast uh, years in advance. Those are things that were planned. Uh, you recall uh, many times talking about opening the fire station. Uh, number 11, that draws that down. Some of the one-time projects that we took on in terms of, uh, for example, the Cayley Library 
project was an intended use of some of our fund balance. Uh, so that, that drawdown should not really surprise anybody. It's, it's something we've been talking about for a long, long time. Looking uh, at the historical picture from 2007 to 2016, over that 10 year time frame, this shows you in terms of the percent of general fund budget for each of those years where our reserves were. And you can see uh, that 2015 and 2016, uh, those declines, as I mentioned, were strategic. They were planned for and, and forecast well in advance. Uh, and in, in 2016, uh, ended the year at 26.5%, as I mentioned a moment ago. We certainly, uh, our goal is to, to continue that track record of, for 17 of finishing the year with uh, uh, that 25% reserve level intact. Moving on then from the general fund uh, results to the capital program. Uh, just briefly to touch on this, uh, it was another very aggressive year for our capital program. Uh, I won't read the whole list of projects. Those are some that were, were completed this year. We actually saw 65 projects uh, completed. Uh, totaling about $98.5 million uh, in expenditures uh, over the entire program. In addition, about $14.5 million was spent through the uh, uh, other capital expenditures, which is essentially our rolling stock, equipment, vehicles, and that kind of thing. So we made a lot of investments in that part of the program as well. The capital fund, or what we often refer to as our second penny fund, uh, we did end the year with about a million dollar balance. Uh, in most years, we would then uh, return to the council uh, early in the following year to provide you with some recommendations or opportunities to appropriate those dollars. This year, uh, my intention would be to take a little different approach and to utilize those dollars as a buffer against declining sales tax revenue. So uh, we don't intend to come back anytime soon to ask you to appropriate those dollars for other projects. Uh, we'll, be, we'll be monitoring that closely because that uh, uh, that revenue stream is, is impacted every bit as much as the uh, sales tax revenues that go into the city's general fund. Looking now at the enterprise activities, uh, we have five enterprise funds, our electric, parking, landfill, water, and water rec. And uh, the, the enterprise funds, of course, are intended to be self-supporting services. In other words, the revenues, uh, the rates that are set and the revenues that are generated from those rates are intended to generate enough revenue to uh, cover all of the costs of providing those services, wages, uh, materials, supplies, services, uh, capital expenditures, and debt service costs as well. So uh, looking at the financial results, this is a, a cash flow report, which is uh, kind of the, the focus in our enterprise funds is on cash flows. You can see that all five enterprise funds did have positive cash flows from operations in 2016. And that provides then cash that can be reinvested into uh, improving our infrastructure within those uh, funds or paying down or and paying down existing debt uh, for those funds that have debt. Three of the five enterprise funds currently are debt free. The lights, parking and landfill uh, ended 2016 with no debt on the books. And uh, all five of our funds uh, ended the year with solid cash balances. So that's certainly a positive aspect to this report. Moving on now to, uh, to uh, the debt outstanding. I know that's a, a key uh, area of interest for the council as well as the public. So I do want to spend uh, a number of slides talking about debt and, and walking you through uh, some of the, the debt uh, information. The, uh, the first thing I want to look at is kind of where we ended 2016 in terms of the debt outstanding compared to uh, the prior year at the end of 2015. And the, this, uh, this table is set up uh, with two categories of debt uh, that I'm reporting on, the governmental debt and enterprise debt. And I think that's an important uh, for you folks to understand that there is an, a, a key distinction between governmental debt and enterprise debt. And you can see that overall the total, total debt changed from 337.2 million uh, at the end of 15 to 342.7 or a net increase of five and a half million dollars uh, over the course of 2016. The governmental debt, and sometimes I'll refer to that as tax supported debt, uh, that's primarily the bonds that are outstanding that will be repaid with our second penny sales tax revenues. 
There are also some other uh, relatively small uh, bonds or notes out there that are repaid with storm drainage fees or tax increment revenues. That amounts to about two, two to three million dollars out of that 342 million. So the, the, the bulk of it is really uh, those bonds that are, are uh, repaid uh, from that second penny sales tax revenue. And you can see that the governmental debt increased uh, over the course of the year by $7.7 .7 million. That reflects the sale of the bonds for the administrative uh, office building. The enterprise debt, uh, of course, as I mentioned, uh, is supported by user rates uh, charged for services provided to the customers of our water and sewer uh, services. Uh, that total debt decreased by $2.2 million uh, over the course of the year. So overall, the increase, as I mentioned, is $5.5 million during 2016. The next few slides I want to walk you through uh, both the governmental debt and the enterprise debt separately, uh, kind of where we've been over the last few years, where we ended 16, and what we project uh, for the, the years to come. So with that in mind, uh, looking at the governmental debt first, through the last uh, five years or so, this graphic shows you from 2010 to through 2016 what the total amount of governmental debt or tax supported debt uh, was outstanding at the end of each of these years. You can see we started in uh, 2010 with $119 million outstanding. Uh, the increase in 2012 uh, became the peak then. That was the year the event center bonds were issued and that peaked at $218 million. And since that time has generally declined uh, until 2016 with the sale of the uh, bonds for the administrative office building. So this year uh, from, from 15 to 16, as I mentioned, is up about 8 million. That's at 7.7 7 .7 million dollars uh, increase in our sales tax bonds. 2016 uh, ended the year with 192 million outstanding. That's $26 million below the peak that we saw or the high point in 2012. So that, that's just the recent history on our governmental debt. We do have, uh, looking forward then over the next uh, six years, we do have plans to do some borrowing, uh, really a, a, a little, uh, a rather modest amount of borrowing uh, within the governmental debt. Uh, primarily, well, pretty much exclusively for storm drainage projects. So some of those projects will be rolling forward in our capital program. So when we take into account where we ended 2016, what we're planning, uh, expect to see over the next six years, this graphic then shows you uh, finishing out, picking up in 2016 at that $192 million level. Uh, the additional borrowing for those storm drainage projects is included in there. And then, of course, the scheduled repayment of that bond or of those uh, debts is reflected in there. So you can see that the balance of outstanding governmental debt uh, will steadily decline over the next six years to a projected outstanding balance in 2022 of 132 million, which is about uh, 86 million dollars below that high point in 2012. So that's the governmental or tax supported uh, debt portion of the discussion. Looking now at the enterprise funds, again, looking at just the, the last six years, uh, starting at the end of 2010, uh, this shows you where we've been in terms of our enterprise debt. And that, interestingly, uh, also hit a high point in 2012 at $181 million in outstanding debt. And that, primarily reflects the uh, SRF loans for water rec and water projects, as well as the Lewis and Clark water bonds that are outstanding and are, are being paid. So you can see it's, uh, it too has also declined steadily from 2012, from that peak to end 2016 at $151 million outstanding from our, uh, within our enterprise funds. That's 30 million below the, the high point of 2012. Now, in the case of the enterprise funds, there is more borrowing activity on the horizon. Um, we do have a number of uh, important projects that will be rolling forward over the next six years. Uh, considerable investments within our water reclamation system, both in our uh, uh, 
wastewater treatment plant facilities and as well as the wastewater conveyance system. And as you folks are, are well aware, uh, we'll soon be talking about, in fact, uh, a little later this afternoon, talking about the public parking uh, investments that we'll be making. So there is a, a lot on the horizon relative to our enterprise funds. So I want to uh, show you the, the picture of what that uh, is expected to look like in terms of our, our level of debt outstanding. When we consider all of those upcoming projects, we can expect the total outstanding to return to that $181 million level as early as the end of this year, 2017. And then it will begin again to decline over the next uh, five years as it tapers off and as uh, more and more debt is, is repaid. One thing I think that's important to understand uh, with enterprise funds, particularly the water and sewer funds, uh, because there is uh, such a need, an ongoing need in a growing community like Sioux Falls to continually invest in those systems, we structure the, the bonds or the SRF loans for those uh, utilities with a very short uh, uh, term. Typical uh, SRF loan is paid off in 10 years. So we're making an investment in infrastructure that will last 50 to 100 years in some cases, but we're paying it off very, very quickly because it's important for the city to recapture that capacity, the financial capacity, to borrow then for the next project that's, that's needed. And uh, that's an ongoing uh, process. And that really reflects, I think this graphic reflects that typical up and down trend. We'll borrow to make those investments, and as we pay them off, that outstanding balance then tapers down. So we've looked now at the governmental or tax-supported debt and the enterprise debt kind of separately. I want to roll them both together on the graphic uh, to show you the, the comprehensive view or the total, total outstanding debt picture. And this shows uh, on an on a all-inclusive basis uh, where we've been from 2010 through 2016. And no surprise, if our governmental debt hit a high point in 2012, our enterprise debt hit a high point in 2012. So clearly when we total them up, 2012 was, was really the high point. And here we are in 2017 now. So no surprise, that was at $399 million at the end of 2012 uh, when we add both our tax supported debt and enterprise debt. Uh, and it, all, it too, the total has generally declined since 2012. We ended 2016, as you can see, with $343 million in outstanding debt. That's up about $6 million. It was $5.5 million uh, from the prior year and $56 million below that 2012 high point. Taking into account then those projects that are on the horizon that are coming forward, uh, that I talked about in storm drainage, water rec, and parking. Uh, looking at what that will do to this overall graph over the next six years, you can see that uh, 2017, we will hit, the, hit a new high point of 363, and well below where we were in 2012, uh, and then it will begin to uh, taper down by 2022, uh, the total amount outstanding will be $291 million. And again, that includes uh, both tax-supported and enterprise debt. That $291 million, uh, where we are expected to be at the end of 2022, uh, is over $100 million below the, uh, the high point, the previous high point of, uh, in 2012, and $52 million below where we ended this past year. So over the next six years, while there's a lot of there will be a lot of projects coming forward uh, that will be financed with borrowing. Uh, even taking that into account, we're, we're uh, showing that the total amount of debt outstanding will continue to decline. You folks do have some important decisions uh, coming in regard to borrowing for those projects. And I'm hoping that, that this uh, extra time we spent reviewing this today will uh, provide a good picture of where we've been in recent years and what we're projecting for the future. Uh, with that said, I know it's, uh, we've got limited time today, so I'm certainly happy to return uh, either to a fiscal committee meeting at some point in the future or an uh, upcoming informational meeting to talk further about city debt as well. Uh, last, I just want to uh, close with a, uh, a quick look ahead to 2017. These are the priorities that we identified uh, in the 2017 budget. 
that was presented and, and adopted by you folks. Uh, they continue to be our priorities for 2017. Nothing has changed. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, we'll continue to manage expenses this year around that 25% res reserve target so we can uh, do everything we can to hit that target at, uh, by the end of 2017. With that, I will take whatever questions you folks have. Thank you, Director. Questions? Councillor Selberg. Thank you. Thank you, Director Turbeck. Um, when looking at a couple of different items, like one that stands out on page one of the financial report, you see on the, for libraries, a surplus of about 814,000. Is that one of those that falls under the, like in the expenditure savings or remodeling projects? I'm assuming that's a big chunk of that. You're looking at this report? I am. Right, the, the Cayley Library uh, remodeling project would have been budgeted uh, as part of that uh, 8.2 million or $8.3 million budget. And so whatever savings resulted from that particular project would be part of that $800,000 number. Okay, okay. Um, you know, the expenditures is 6.7 million in savings is certainly encouraging. I mean, are there many instances in that number where um, we've maybe budgeted for certain maintenance and repair projects, but then we've held off on that. Does that add up to a certain amount of what we've saved? We were uh, quite deliberate about avoiding that, so we weren't kicking the can down the road, so to speak, or digging a hole for ourselves. I think you know, that, that's certainly the temptation. It's easy to put off uh, repair and maintenance types of projects, but we made every effort to, to not do that, to, uh, to leave ourselves in a good position as we go into 17 so we aren't don't feel like we're behind the eight ball uh, in that regard. Okay, and the biggest items I think you'd mentioned, it's what fuel, remodeling projects, snow removal, those were the biggest chunk of the 6.7 million of savings, okay. Right. And the last question would be, um, so this available fund balance that I would see on the next page, the 989-808, this surplus, is that the capital surplus that you referred to? That's correct. Okay, and this is what you're talking about using as maybe a buffer this year, something different? That would be my intention, yeah. The, the concern is, of course, that if we today were to appropriate that for projects and committed that to be spent on projects and sales tax revenues continue to decline, we won't have that money to spend. So it's, it's important that, that we, because we don't maintain a reserve per se in our capital fund, that's not something that, that's ever been supported. Um, so every dollar we anticipate taking in from that second penny sales tax uh, every year is put into the budget to, to, to be put to work on projects. So when we're in an environment where our sales tax revenues are trending below what we're anticipating in the budget, uh, then we, we've got to find a way to, to scale back. And this is an easy way uh, to provide a buffer without uh, rolling back planned projects or cutting projects out of the budget. Okay. Now, it, it could come to that, certainly, if sales tax revenues continue to decline, and that's not enough of a buffer. You know, that's certainly possible. And as it's a capital surplus, that would be something the council would have to appropriate? Right. Okay. Right. If, if we get partway through the year and it, and, um, it appears that uh, sales tax revenues are picking up and we're seeing stronger growth, um, then certainly we could revisit that. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Neitzer. This is, I guess, sort of budget 101, but do carry forwards only apply to capital and equipment? The, uh, that's been the practice in the past. Um, I don't think that's a hard and fast rule per se. Um, ordinarily, that's just the nature of capital projects, uh, capital budgets, that they oftentimes will begin in one year and be finished in another year. Um, so we, we tend to avoid using those in operational budgets where you're, whatever you're doing this year for, you know, whether it's wages or supplies, uh, that shouldn't necessarily be carrying over into the next year. Okay. Is it's they, not to say that it couldn't happen, but it's, it hasn't been utilized in the past. Okay. And then, so if you, if you just decide not to do a road project this year, is that a carry forward or is that only for something that's kind of in the middle and not done yet? If it's intended to be uh, completed, it would be carried forward. So if we've got budget for a project, uh, for example, in the 2016 year, if we had budget for a project that we are still planning to do, that, that 
uh, budget amount would be carried forward so that it's available to be complete that project then in 2017. Okay, and then if if I have a uh, if I estimate a project is going to cost two million dollars to build a road, you get a favorable bid, and it's one and a half. I've saved five hundred. Can that 500 just be used? I assume that you can use that for another project that maybe you were thinking you might do, or maybe another project comes in overbid and make up the difference. Can, right, can, can that savings be carried to another year or two? Or? The, what, what typically happens in that case, and it, it is a, uh, a balancing act throughout the year as projects go to bid and are awarded um, because they're never exactly what was estimated. Um, but public works in particular, uh, we're, we're talking about that, but they, they always have kind of a, a list they're working off of. So if money becomes available, they can maybe make a little more progress getting down their list of, of projects that they're planning to do. If money gets tight or bids come in high or for whatever reason, they've got to raise that line a little bit and they aren't gonna get quite as much done that year. But they've got the ability to, to manage that within their total capital budget. Okay, and then if there's, so I mean, if there's like a road project in the five-year plan and they thought it, they might do it in 18, but hey, I've got extra money in 17, could they accelerate that if the engineering was done? If it's ready there? to go, yeah. Okay, and then finally, I saw the platting fees were, I think, double the the um, the projected amount. Is that, I, I assume that's really hard to project what the platting fees are gonna be because that's really kind of up to development? It's, it's very difficult uh, to project and it's, you know, if you look back historically, it has been all over the board. Okay, so thanks. It makes it difficult to project. Okay, thank you. Councillor Erickson. Thank you. Um, I'm just curious, as we talked about having the, the surplus left over, um, I guess if there's an update or what the intention is for the archive building. If there's any, where is that coming from or what's the plan with that? I know we haven't heard anything about that for a while, so I'm just mm -hmm. curious. Uh, the, the intention, as I understand it, is, is for the city to uh, include that in the, in the plan for 2018. Okay, makes sense, thank you. Councillor Staley. Um, I, yeah, I have three, uh, three questions. Uh, the first, on page 10, I was just looking at um, 2016, uh, from 20, going forward, we're gonna be adding like the 24 million on to that for the um, administration building, governmental debt, I mean, write that at some point. That's in there. Those bonds were sold in 2016. So looking uh, so at that. So then why, would, why wouldn't that be 24 million then one, be, okay, you got the 184 and then up to 192. Because we paid bonds off as well. So, so that much So that is the net difference that's seven or excuse me yeah about six six million seven eight I guess seven point seven million if I remember. okay and then uh, I just wanted to know back over to these enterprise funds approximately forty three million dollars total water water reclamation is in savings so to speak right we got cash on hand oh you're looking at the yeah I'm the looking at the enterprise statement. funds so that that would be The, uh, the water 26 fund. 26 plus 17, about 43 million. Those are, those are the correct numbers. Cash on hand, right? Available so here. so does that sit like in a money market? It's part of the city's investment pool. So yeah, it's managed along with all other uh, city cash. What kind of an interest rate does that usually get? Well, interest rates are quite low where we, uh, we invest in bank CDs uh, and US treasury securities. So interest rates are one percent. Not great, but yeah. One point three. Well, it, it varies a lot because the the investments within that pool are laddered out. There's there are some that will mature next month, some that will mature in in two months, and some that will re mature in four or five years from now. So those are spread out over time. Each one of those earning a little bit different interest rates. So it's hard to give you a uh, a rate that we're earning on that. Okay, and then the last question is. Um, and if we're talking with the public and, and if the, the, the growth continues to go downhill, what, what's gonna be our plan long-term? Or do you have any kind of a, an emergency plan about how we're gonna 
cut Coming corners up. and yet maintain services because there's we've got these fixed expenses like the debt payment that we mm -hmm. can never get out of so what what would be the plan you're talking about if sales tax revenue growth continues to slow exactly yeah we have uh, we have spent a considerable amount of time working with the departments to develop a 2017 contingency plan so that if if revenues uh, aren't growing uh, as, as needed to support the existing budget that we will will manage through that just like we did in 2016. So each department was asked to put together a, a contingency plan, as we've called it, uh, to make those adjustments. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, Tracy, thank you very much for a very uh, detailed report. I think we maybe underestimated a little bit on the presentation side of things, but uh, we do appreciate the in-depth uh, information that you provided. Happy to be here. So thank, thank you. you. Okay, well, that moves us half to the halfway point here now, and so our next uh, item of uh, discussion, mixed-use parking ramp project uh, agreements, and uh, Brent O'Newell, Economic Development Manager, is going to present on that. So welcome, Brent, and we're ready whenever you have your slide presentation ready. There we go, it is ready. Thanks for having me, Brent O'Neill, uh, Economic Development Division. Darren and Matt are both here and can supplement me with questions if needed along the way. The main reason we're here tonight is to give you a snapshot on a couple of things that we're gonna bring you in March. And um, we met with uh, David Bixler, Jim David, about two weeks ago to give them a snapshot of uh, some of those things and a snapshot of the project. And we intend to keep uh, that dialogue going with them as well, and I, I know I think most of the council is looking forward to the memo that we sent. And I know this Councilor Knightsert's request in particular. Uh, this is a very simplified overview of those uh, things that will be coming up uh, before the council in order for this project to move forward. The four things on the left are the things that we'll be discussing in March, and I'll get into greater detail uh, on those. And then the things on the right are things that would uh, be considered throughout uh, this project development and ultimately what's needed to authorize the project to go forward. Um, for sake of time, I'm probably going to uh, uh, pass this, but we'd be happy to revisit if there are questions on any of these. This is a slide that you guys have seen before, or at least in a, in a somewhat modified form. We've tried to break out the kind of the chronological order of the project into various phases, and it's largely synchronized with the design elements, the design phases of the project. So that conceptual and preliminary planning process has been done, which gets us to where we are today. And then uh, in the April, May timeframe, we wanna get to a point of presenting the council much more of the project details. And in order to get there, we have to go through that schematic design phase, which involves a handful of things, including getting our architect on board uh, full time. So what we'll be able to achieve through this uh, next six to eight weeks and, and working through that schematic design is getting you these several topics uh, as details when you are considering the full project approval step. That includes uh, an update to the program elements. We've said, for example, that we are targeting a parking ramp that would be 400 to 650 spaces. We've already, I think, narrowed that down a little bit, especially off the high end, and it'll be something a little bit smaller. But by going through this design phase, we'll really be able to hone in on the number of spaces. Uh, as schematic design is complete, you'll get to see some scale and massing of the project. The materials and drawings will be available. We'll have a construction cost estimate. We'll have our financial uh, model refined and, and forecast, not only for the ramp and the financing of the ramp, but the system as a whole. And then the structure of the, the financing, in particular the debt that would go along with approval of a project like this. And I apologize that, as I look up there, is a misprint of agreements in March 2017. On the next couple of weeks, we want to bring forward uh, these four items for council consideration. I will point out uh, right away that those first three, kind of per the standard procedure, bringing agreements to the council would typically fall on the consent agenda uh, under that item number one, the, the consent agreement memo. And uh, so that would be our intent here and would 
certainly be happy to get into any greater detail or answer questions on those today. And then the JLG architect agreement would be one that uh, per protocol would be appropriate to bring by resolution. So we do intend on having that on agenda with resolution and uh, a follow-up presentation on that agreement, what's in there and any discussion that you guys might have. Uh, I think uh, uh, the little narrative that goes with them does give a very quick snapshot. Uh, walker parking, we, we feel it's essential to have that level of expertise on a project like this. They'll do anything from making sure we've got the proper spacing of spaces to ensuring columns are in the right location to making sure we're appropriately uh, looking at slopes of decks and uh, 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 in some cases trying to keep them as flat as possible. There's a lot of elements. I, I don't have the full list with me, but there's like 11 or 12 different things that they're going to help us through uh, at the schematic phase. One additional one would be just the entry points and how the systems uh, would allow people in and out and the various uh, either payment systems or leasing systems that would be in place. I believe you're aware of a storm pipe. It's a major pipe. It's a 60-inch pipe that uh, is really transversing the middle of the site. So we'd be looking at relocating this uh, to a adjacent edge of the property, the east edge. And so Sayer and Associates has been uh, consulting with us a little bit already on this. And so that uh, scope would uh, allow them to continue that design work on that storm pipe. As we talk about the financing piece for this project, uh, we have been pretty clear that uh, debt would be needed to fully fund the project. Perkins and Cooey would be a firm that would uh, help us through setting up some of those pieces and again as part of that package that you guys would see in a few months to truly present uh, uh, um, the legal structure and make sure everything is, is properly set up as you consider the project at that time. And then uh, the contract that we'd be bringing by resolution is for the architect, JLG is the architect that we've been working with, not only ourselves, but the private partner that we've been working with. And we would bring this contract um, as a single contract, it would be two phases. And it was our intent to uh, uh, really negotiate the contract from start to finish all in one swoop. Uh, we felt it left us in better position to get the best uh, contract done. But it is going to be set up in two phases with a contingency on the full project approval that we're going to ask the council for in April or May. Getting through that schematic design uh, has a $150,000 element to it. Um, the, the remaining elements of design are backloaded on the following uh, approval stage of the design. So I designed documents and putting construction docs and helping us getting through a bidding process. So that, that second piece of that contract would be contingent on the council approving the project and restoring uh, the full project funding for the project. So that, in a nutshell, was our main intent. And I, I meant to uh, thank Tracy and his team. We asked to cut into some of their time today to give you this five minute update. So with that, I'll pause. Again, the three of us are here for questions. Questions? Questions for Brent? Yes, Councillor Nicer. Can you go back one slide, look at the, that list of four again? Yes. So would it be fair to say that you would say that we need all four of these to give us the price tag and the details and the payment structure for us to make a decision? Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the one that I might say maybe on is the Sayer one, although I think it it gives us more confidence in what we're designing to kind of co-design uh, that pipe at the same time. Uh, for example, if we realize that, that we had to move it a foot or even two feet one way, if that could impact the actual footprint of the ramp, we'd want to know that sooner. But So I would say yes, all four, that would be the one that I might say maybe on. Okay, and then are, are these four, are, are these just contracts locking in specifically who's doing various pieces of the money already appropriated in the CIP, or is this more? Um, this is money that we would anticipate coming from the, the money that was left in the CIP for this project. Okay. Um, that's what I got. Thank you. Yeah. Councillor Staley. Um, <clears throat> I, I had a conversation today with Michael Bender um, about the, the previous project mm -hmm. on this. How much money did the city spend in that transaction? Um, I would have to 
research that number and well I mean how far in. down this this how many of these pieces did you get to with that if I could make a comparison to this in and I it's fair to say that the two projects are structured a little bit differently in terms of process so it's hard to do a full apples to apples comparison of where we are in the sequence uh, but we did do uh, some architectural work it would have been at a smaller earlier stage than what's in, in this uh, mm -hmm. scope up there. And then Walker has also been involved with us mm -hmm. uh, on that project. Mm -hmm. um, we, like I said, we did a little bit of, of work with Sayer, but that's kind of independent uh, of the bigger, pro of, the, of the two projects. It was a, necess a necessity that we were gonna work on either way. So I don't, I, I'd almost consider that kind of so a So do you think it cost. could have been that 100,000 was possibly spent? Um, I, yeah. Without speculating, I, I really would prefer to just double check with our finance team, and I can email you or, or Jim well, or David. because he, he indicated to me that he and the Ramcota Corporation spent 125,000 of their money for that that proposal that, sure. that didn't work. So let's just say that this thing, because we have not said yes on, on going ahead with this. Right. Okay, so let's say that we don't want to do this ramp. At the end of the day, we're going to already spend two hundred thirty-one thousand dollars before we would come to that decision. Or do we need to be voting down these consent agenda items along the way? It, let's say we're not on board. Sure. Well, we one, um, um, you know, that is a, a sequence of of contracts to get us to a point where we can make the full decision, or the council can make the full decision. And this really is a necessary step. Uh, to get to that April May time frame of being able to consider the full project I I will say that I, I think to the point of your question is um, you know at what point are are the council or individual council members comfortable you know spending money to pursue this project and this is a project that we believe in uh, it's been identified for you know, several years, we're going to be, uh, I think there's a tour tomorrow and we're gonna be sharing some other details. But it's, it's, not, it's not a given that we're all gonna vote for the project. Correct. So, I mean, I'm just concerned that you, you spend 231,000, which I added that up, and then, and then we say no to it. And at that point, then the argument could be made, we've already invested so much money, we have to move forward with it. So, just. Yeah. No, I, I understand that point. I. I um, I think it's just something the council is going to have to consider. Okay, Councillor Erpenbach. Brent, remind me again on that slide, how much of that is tax dollars? This would all, uh, on that slide, I'd have to check with finance to confirm on the Perkins and Cooley, but I believe it is all the enterprise fund, which would be non-tax dollars. It's all paid by people who actually use parking facilities in Correct. the city of Sioux Falls, right? Okay, um, and then I had one other question about um, kind of kind of a rabbit hole, but I don't recall the pipe thing from the first conversation we had when we were first looking at this as a potential parking ramp. Is the pipe a new thought? Something that we just discovered, or have I just lost all no, memory of that? No, that's fair. Um, we have talked about it for a while, but as we were doing some of our preliminary work, it's a hundred-year-old or hundred and ten-year-old pipe that we just didn't didn't track down right away in our first uh, pieces and we're budgeting for it and so forth. So it is, it was a, a element that we weren't ready for when it happened. So it's, is it, we're using it? Is it oh, something yeah. that has yeah. stuff running through it? Then yeah. we just it's, have to pick it up yeah. and move it now. It's, it's a 60 oh, inch pipe and nice. it serves a lot of uh, the Southwest part of downtown. Right. Oh geez, okay, good, thank you. Councilor Neitzer. Just one quick follow up. What, where does the uh, eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars? Where, where does how did that get arrived at? For the sure, um, that's what we and when we get to the point of fully talking about this contract, we do set it up as a hundred fifty thousand lump sum for schematic. The eight hundred fifty is going to be a not to exceed number, based on a percentage, uh, a cost associated for design against the budget 
for the project when we established the budget at schematic. So it's, it's, it's going to be a bit of a floating number. It's a not to exceed number. Okay, and the 150 is what we authorized and the, the contract would stipulate that upon project funding by the council, it, you could be paid up to this amount for the rest of the project. Correct. Okay, thanks. Councilor Erickson. Sorry, just piggybacking off what he said. What is that percentage then? Is it safe to say that would be 3% of the contract? Because I think we usually do a percentage based on the event center as well as the indoor aquatic center yep. was, I think, a percentage of the total yep. value. Is that? Yep. In this case, it will be about 6%. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Councillor Starr? Yes. Thanks for being here, Brent. It's, yeah, uh, you're this is helpful to uh, start the process or continue the process to see where we're at. Um, just initially, I wonder how many uh, engineers that we have on staff that design uh, sewer and water pipes, and I know Director Cotter's here, but for an $11,000 project, it sure seems like something we could maybe handle internally as, as we move forward, but more a, a thought process than, than, than going out for bids as I'm looking at this. The other thing that I don't see in the timeline is any time uh, scheduled for public input or public meetings to, to show downtown uh, businesses and developers in the area um, some time to take to, to look at the project and, and open it up to the public other than at council meetings and things. So I'd encourage sure. uh, uh, community development to add that to the timeline yeah. that we would have a, an opportunity for a couple of evenings at the either at the library just like we did with the railroad redevelopment or all the other large city projects that we do some time to take input from the public as as part of this once we get a design and schematic of where we're going sure no very well um, the other thing is is I, I want to at least publicly say thank you to uh, Mr. Drake with Legacy Development. He's taken the time to uh, sit down as the, the potential partner in this project and uh, work with council members to take a look at his dream and desire of, of what he will build. And uh, um, I'll encourage him as well to, to open that up to the public as well as how this project uh, uh, moves forward and how our partnership with Legacy uh, uh, materializes as we work through this project. So again, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, seeing no more questions and thank you very much. And I'd also like to thank uh, Matt Nelson, our, our manager of parking facilities and director Ketchum for being here, making yourselves available for any questions. Thank you very much, Brent. You're welcome. Okay, our final item of, for presentation, snow season operational update. Uh, including the use of snow gates. And we're going to have uh, Director Cotter is here as well as our street manager, uh, Galen Huber. So welcome, Director Cotter. Uh, thank you for having us. We're, uh, we're looking forward to having this discussion and we also have a unique video to show you at the end of our presentation. Um, so today we're really gonna focus on the snow and ice removal operational uh, approach that we took in 2016 and then we'll give you a more of a mid-year update uh, for 2017. When we talk about snow season we talk about November through March um, but then just know that the city's budget is on a calendar year so it really captures January through March and then November through December. Okay. Uh, the snow budget for 2017 is 7.67 million um, and so first of all thank you for your support of that budget. I think it's a direct reflection of what this community values as safety and keeping Sioux Falls moving um, when we have challenging winter weather. Uh, some basics, uh, just to somewhat set the table here. Every time it snows, we first focus on the emergency snow routes and those maps are, are on our website. Uh, and then we also go around the schools. Then as the weather either progresses or dissipates, we start to change the operation to make sure that we can uh, meet the needs of the uh, traveling public. The volume of the snow and the winter conditions determine if a snow alert is warranted. So when you hear the word snow alert, uh, you can directly uh, equate that to that we're going into the neighborhoods. Um, anything other than that, we could just be out, we may get an, an inch of snow and we've just either got a sanding force um, out on, uh, with our sanders out on the main roads um, or we may end up, as it starts to build up, start to put more plows on the main routes. But until you actually see a snow alert's been uh, declared, um, we're just going to focus on the emergency routes around the schools. And if necessary, we'll go into the secondary routes. 
Uh, I think it's notable, and we've got it on one of our slides, that um, you know, I think we all know snow removal is expensive. And so we had, we actually had five events in 2016 that we received over three and a half inches of snow that we did not plow. And so uh, conditions were favorable. Um, in most cases, it was going to be 40 degrees and rising the next week. And so the most efficient way to move snow is to allow Mother Nature to do it and it just drained down the street. Um, but every time we make that call, we make it very seriously because we know that uh, there's an enormous force that spins up to clear the streets, um, but we wanna leverage uh, the temperatures as best we can, okay? Uh, once a snow alert's declared, then we send out a detailed plowing schedule for zone one, two, and three. Um, one of the things I just want to uh, establish for you is that our operators and our private contractors, they work very hard to do great work. When, when we've sat down with them and asked them what's their greatest challenge, uh, their greatest challenge is parking on the streets. And so we've used the local media to get the word out about snow alerts. Um, and then we've, with um, Heather Hitterdahl's help, we've got actually about eight different mediums that we use to get uh, the word out about uh, the plowing schedule from Facebook, Twitter, uh, text alerts, um, they're all very effective and whatever means that our customers use to get that information, we're comfortable with. Um, I would share with you my personal preferences um, with the smartphone if you not, have not set up. Uh, getting a text alert for a snow alert is very simple. Uh, just text snow to 605-413-1990. Uh, and then right after that, within about 45 minutes of us declaring a snow alert, if you're in town or out of town, you will get a text alert so you know that um, what the plowing schedule is and that you can remove your cars. A couple points about snow gates. Snow gates are used citywide. Uh, we've successfully deployed them since the public vote and every plow team, so when we go into a neighborhood, the plows go out in teams. So there's one plow that plows at the center line and then there's another plow that plows at the curb line. Every one of those teams have at least one motor grader that has a snow gate. Um, I know that you guys have heard this, but just want to reiterate, um, and certainly based on the volume, it changes. Uh, but snow gates do reduce the amount of snow in driveways. They don't eliminate it. Uh, we've got some pictures in the presentation tonight that show some of the challenges that our operators face. Uh, and then we'll verbalize some of the things that they do to kind of adjust their operations. So those property owners also provide, uh, are provided good service. Uh, for example, like a cul-de-sac. Um, after the PowerPoint presentation, we do have a new video to show you uh, that um, our CityLink team teamed up with a local vendor uh, to showcase one of our operators, Matt DeShepard. He's actually here um, uh, plowing a neighborhood street in a motor grader. The technology that's used will give you uh, a front seat view of what it's like to actually be a, a motor grader operator. And you'll be able to see uh, Matt drive and use the snow gate uh, and drive around cars. And, um, and Galen will narr narrate through it so you can see uh, the different GoPros and the 360 view cameras operate just to give you a really good front door uh, picture. Matt has been with the city. He's one of the best we have. He's been with the city for 17 years and uh, we hope you enjoy it. Uh, managing and conducting snow and ice removal operations is a substantial effort. We've got a number of partners to bring attention to you and thank. Uh, first, the city team members of fleet, finance, legal, parks, fire, police, public parking, central services, planning and building services, and public works. All these departments essentially come together when there's a snow event, um, and it becomes the top priority until we are done. Next is our private contractors. They plow nearly 40% of the city out when we go into a snow alert, and so we've got a substantial force of private contractors that also use snow gates um, to make sure that we can have good timely snow removal. And then last but not least, the National Weather Service. We consider them partners. They're a fantastic crew that works 24-7. Um, we normally get worried when they call us because uh, they know that something's coming in that maybe wasn't forecasted. So. Uh, but let's get through the presentation. Galen Huber, he's our street operations manager. He, he leads this effort for public works and um, has some great content to show. Thanks. Thank you, Director Connor. Welcome, Galen. Thank you. Galen Huber, street manager for public works. It has been a while since I've been here, so I thank you for uh, letting me give you this update on snow. We'll start with the 2016 season 
and it will work in the 2017 season. Again, like Mark mentioned, like Mark mentioned, um, we're, our fiscal year cuts into two different winters. So we go from January to March and November to December. Just some interesting facts about Sioux Falls. We average 44 inches. We have 3,000 lane miles that we clear out once I call a snow alert. That's like from LA to New York, uh, 78 square miles. This year we've implemented 20 snow districts and by dividing the city, excuse me, dividing the city, I have some German ancestry, I gotta move my hands when I talk. Um, um, when uh, by snow districts, what we do is we put like equipment in each one of the 20 districts so no one area is treated um, quicker than any other area. Uh, so we divide up all the equipment that we have, put them in each of the districts and they all start at the same time. We went from 18 to 20 to try to reduce the amount of time that's taking us to, to get to the very last house in the city. We staff 24-7, uh, November 1st through uh, March 31st. If you call any one of those, during any one of those days, night or day, one, a person will answer the phone. If they don't answer, that means they are on the phone right now talking to somebody. Uh, but we do have normal shifts that work throughout that time frame. Uh, when we do call a snow alert, there's 100 city employees that work directly on the streets. Mark mentioned the police, the fire, um, fleet, and engineering that help in other s factors of snow removal, but 100 city employees are in equipment working on the street um, every 12 hour shift. So that's 200 city employees that, that I have coming in that are helping with that project. And, my, and again, our budget for 17 is $7.6 million for this fiscal year, January through December. Um, if you haven't been to my street campus, I just wanna go over our assets that we have a little bit. We have the ability to source 16,000 tons. I have three domes there. Uh, we receive salt throughout the uh, uh, winter season um, and they deliver to us. Um, and during a, a typical year, uh, when we get 44 inches, we would go through approximately 19,000 tons of salt. So it requires them to uh, replenish my supplies for me to get through that last snowstorm in March. Um, a little bit about our equipment, probably something that people don't really know. The city of Sioux Falls has 92 miles of sidewalk that we have to clear, and we clear it under ordinance requirements. Um, there are teams clearing sidewalks while I'm clearing streets. Um, approximately 50 miles of those sidewalks are park properties. The other are city-owned properties that a public works team is, is going after and cleaning out. Um, we have six blowers and two atheists. We have 50 miles of snow that we pick up after a snow event. Uh, to clear, I uh, have 56 sanders. We have 45 uh, uh, motor graders, 40 or at least, five the city owns, and then 23 uh, contractor motor graders. Those motor graders are the bread and butter of the snow operation. This last snow event on Friday, we get went through the city in 23 hours. The reason for that was 70 motor graders. That's how you get through a city in, in 23 hours with 3,000 lane miles. There's an athe in the lower center that's picking up snow. And then again, our salt trucks and being loaded for chemical going out. Uh, Mark mentioned the National Weather Service. Um, I talk to these people more than my wife during the winter time, which is a bad thing. Um, this just happens to be a, f a shot, screenshot of, of uh, this, this was a screenshot on Thursday morning before the, the Thursday night, Friday event. You, you can see, you can see what, um, what they had forecast in there. Uh, Thursday night, they were still forecasting that, that 10 to 14 inches of snow. Um, if Way at the top is a weather bar, um, and it works its all the way down. Those are very helpful. You, a lot of times, you you'll hear me talk about the grid. This is the grid. Uh, this is my Bible during the wintertime to follow. And we stay in constant contact with them uh, going into the event, through the event, uh, so that we plan for the manpower and equipment that we actually need. Um, with, uh, for the most part, I'm gonna be talking about fiscal year snow events, but for this particular uh, slide, I wanna talk about the 15-16 the season, which is November of 15 through March of 16. We had 68.5 inches of snow. It was the fifth most snow that we had in the city of Sioux Falls. We had snow alerts um, all, the way, all the way up that we had 14 inches on the uh, south side of town, and we um, used snow gates every one of those events. The 2016 season ended up with 49 inches of snow. Um, again, that's January through December. 
We had three snow alerts. Um, those are the dates and the uh, snow amounts that we had. Like Mark mentioned, there was five snow events over three and a half inches uh, that we did not declare a snow alert. Um, it was ba based on safety first. What is the snow content? How much water is it? is in it when it packs on the street how safe is it to drive after taking a look at that we take a look at the weather to see what we have for weather coming in and each one of those five events we believe with close contact with weather service national weather service that we could let the snow melt instead of using taxpayer dollars to plow out the snow um, that that those five snow events that we didn't plow helped us with that budget turn back in highways and streets of 2.1 million. Now highways and streets is engineering and streets and within streets it's snow and street maintenance. Um, in snow, in snow, uh, snow I, I saved around a million dollars, but in street maintenance I also saved money by holding back on some of the overtime that we normally do during the paving season. Um, we were able to save back some money and still get all the blocks that we wanted to get paved and microsurface, we still got all those done. Snow alerts is the, that's the dicey question. Um, there's no good answer for anybody. I can't tell you right now whether or not we call a snow alert until I actually see it and when it's coming down and when it's on the ground. I've called the snow alerts at two inches of snow. I've not called the snow alerts at 6.2 inches of snow. It all depends on how the snow is and what it looks like. So when people ask me, Galen, tell me when you call a snow alert, what is it? How much, they want a black and white answer. I can't give them that. It's all based on conditions on the street as we see them out there. Um, and so, uh, again, I can't give you a number. I'm just, trust me that we're doing the, what we think is the best based on all the people we have out there um, and what we're seeing from, uh, um, from, from within. If a snow alert is, is declared, we plow out all the, all the city streets within the city of Sioux Falls, including 19 miles of gravel and all the alleyways. Uh, plows will enter the, the, the residentials as soon as we get done with the uh, clearing the last of the emergencies. That means the snow has to quit. I, I will not go into the residentials with another inch of snow coming into the, into the city. That's not fair to, fair to those people that they get snow on my plowed out streets. I wait for the snow to be done. We, that's when we start going in. That's when the clock starts ticking. Um, this, this particular last storm I'll use, for example, the snow alert went out at 4.30. Right at 4.30, we were basically on, done with the emergency routes and secondaries around schools. We jumped right into the zone three. And so we were finished from, we went from 4.30 on Friday morning and finished on uh, Saturday at 4 a.m. So we went just at 23 hours. Um, we try to allow the people to know as much in advance as we can um, whether or not we're going to call a snow alert for us to get the cars and vehicles off the street. It, is, it reduced the amount of time for me out there. Plus, any time I plow around a vehicle, we normally get called and ask for us to plow it back when that vehicle is moved. So that's additional time and effort. So if this, it's not there to begin with, we can, we can clear the streets. We put these things together. Heather works with me very closely in a lot of this stuff. We put out news releases to the media. The media has been very good at always getting this out as soon as it's sent. Uh, the city webpage is, as soon as the, web, uh, the alert goes out, it's put on the webpage. Uh, city Link puts it up and scrolls it. You can get, sign up for emails. You can sign up for text messaging. Um, uh, Heather runs their Facebook and Twitter accounts for us. And then we put it on the Kello clothesline too. So it's running, scrolling for out on that. So that's the different ways we're working with to try to allow the public to know when we're, when we're calling a snow alert. The 2017 season so far um, is, you know, today's the last day so of January, February. We average 14.6 inches of snow in January, February. We have 14.5 inches of snow um, during this time frame. We had a snow alert in January of 7.3, and this one on Friday was 5.2. And with that, I'll, I wanna go into snow gates a little bit. I know that you as counselors get called about um, how we operate out there, and I just want to go over some of the things that um, may help you understand our, our process. First of all, the snow gates are used citywide during snow alerts, and um, we are, and, and I'll get into this a little bit as we go along, as we, um, this is our sixth year with snow gates, it's the third year since the requirement of snow gates, but we've been actually working with snow gates after six years, and we've learned some things from that, and we're changed in the way we approach the snow removal with snow gates. And so um, 
we are going after all the emergency snow routes, three lanes or, um, or less is what we've been hitting. We are experimenting with going with all emergency snow routes, even the larger streets, and seeing if we can't pull that snow. Because we put a lot of salt on them, there isn't as much snow on them, and we're, we're seeing that we can pull that stuff across and still able to, to hold it in the gate and pull it through. So we're experimenting with the larger, um, larger uh, emergency snow routes. We actually, over the last two events, went with all snow gates throughout the entire city, including the larger ones. Uh, snow gates will reduce the amount of snow. It will not eliminate it. Uh, Minot, North Dakota, who has probably had snow gates uh, for the longest, as far as I know, in, in North Dakota, says that after 16 years uh, at a population of 40,000 people, they still take 50 to 60 calls every snow alert saying that they didn't think they used snow gates. So that's something that's not going to go away. I just need to be able to substantiate by, through looking at this whether or not the snow gate was used or if it was used and we just put snow in, go, comes around. Um, snow gates are not used for around mailboxes, fire hydrants, and corners because I need a place to store 44 inches. Again, we were experimenting with this. And this past time, we pulled the past two events, we pulled through mailboxes. You're going to see the video, and you'll actually see Matt pulling the snow past the mailbox before he opens it up. So it eliminates the issue of dropping snow and then the homeowner having to come out in the street and clear this snow out. He doesn't have to clear out his driveway, he still has to clear out his mailbox or they won't get delivered. Motor graders always work in pairs. And, my, and you'll see in the video that the, the front motor grader may get ahead of the rear motor grader. And people will call and say, we're not using snow gates in their areas. And there is a snow gate with each pair. It's just that sometimes they see my center motor grader. And I'll tell you, I'm my worst own enemy. I have three motor graders where I have snow gates on the center motor grader also because I have extras. If I break down one, we stop until a snow gate comes. So in order to save time, we flop them. So sometimes these center motor graders go by without the gate, gate going down, but they're not supposed to. So people see that and they call. Again, we try to explain that to them, and that's why I encourage them to call. We're more than willing to come out and take a look and investigate if they have an issue. The use of snow gates uh, can narrow driveways or narrow streets, excuse me. Um, certainly, we had two really good years. Um, last year, with that 68 inches of snow, we had 17 inches in November, it melted. 19 inches in December, it melted. And then we had that, the rest of the snow. We always had uh, ample opportunity to store snow. So um, we haven't seen the narrowing. One of these years, I'll have to pay the piper, and, and we may get that narrowing. The reason for the narrowing is, is that you can't move fast enough with a snow gate to get it to roll. It pushes and drops back. And as you're pushing and dropping back, we sometimes have to cheat to let the snow out so that we don't put it into the driveway, billows around. And when we cheat to try and let that snow out, we're, we're, we're causing that narrowing effect. Snow gates, in, in some places, they suspend them after seven inches, seven inches or more. Certainly, we see that um, snow gates in the seven inch range and higher puts more snow in the driveway, but it's still taking snow out. I still got, on that 14 inches last year, I got calls from the south side. Elon, I got snow in my driveway, but it's less than if we went to use them. So as of today, we still don't have set a time frame. I'm still planning on using them every snow alert until to, there comes a point where it, it could have been this last time with 14 inches of wet snow that would have broke more than I had available, and then I might have had to take a look at that. But that will be a special circumstance. But I tend to use snow gates every snow alert that we have, no matter the amount. Challenges. And let me talk about challenges. Challenges, I don't mean to mean, uh, uh, belittle snow gates at all. I think snow gates are doing a great job. They help us a lot with our plowbacks. Normally, when we did a plowback, we'd end up using a motor grader without a snow gate on, and we end up getting snow in the driveway. Now, when we do plowbacks, we send a motor grader with a snow gate out. So when we plow back, we throw the gate down and go past the driveway, and nobody gets it in, the, in there. And, and my guys, like Matt, like that, because they're in there trying to fish the snow out. This way, they can just keep it out immediately. What by challenges, I mean we have to change the way we come through the neighborhood to minimize the amount of snow that goes into their driveway. And these are some of the areas where we have to work to modify the way we run through the, run the neighborhood. And I want to, let's start with the left-hand side. The lower left-hand picture is a, is, is a driveway that's on a long street. And it's one of the first driveways that we come to. 
We'll put the gate down, and it does its job. You know, I mean, it left some snow, but you can see that the the row, the wind row height prior to the apron and after the apron is higher than what it is in in the in the driveway. So yes, no build it around, but it's less than what it would have been if we would wind have used the gate. The next driveway is just two two driveways down from this one. What's happening is as the gate as we're pulling down the street, we're pulling more and more snow. It's not getting out of the blade, and we throw the gate down. There's no more room in the blade for it to go, so it billows around the, the, the uh, motor grader. I actually had a supervisor driving this, following this, so I know for a fact that snow gates went down on these streets. It's just that, take a look at the upper left-hand corner, it looks like we didn't use a snow gate. The gate went down, and it just billowed around it. Cul-de-sacs are another one. They, they were an issue 10 years ago before we had snow gates. They are hard to clean because the poor people that live on the left-hand side of the bulb there tend to get a lot more snow than the right-hand side. Again, it has to deal with that concept of the long street. You're coming in and you're pulling as best you can around, and what happens as you're going around in a circle, there's so much snow in that bulb, and we're trying to pull some of that out, but there's so much snow in the bulb that that, that left-hand side of the, of the bulb usually ends up with more snow. We try to work that. We sometimes back and go back around and suck some of that out with the snow gate. Uh, we're trying to modify that a little bit and trying to pull a little bit more out of the cul-de-sac and feather it down the street so we don't impact the cul-de-sac so much. The other thing is uh, twin home, townhomes and mailboxes. Uh, I want to, again, we tried to work with the, the last two times with us pulling past the, snow bo the mailbox. We try to do that. We can't always do that, but we try to do that. Um, so that it alleviates that issue with the, with, with the uh, homeowner having to do what he did on the right-hand side, and that's have to take a snowblower out on the street to clear his mailbox. The other thing is the, le the two pictures on the left. Um, these are uh, some townhomes. I see these on the east and west side in the central part. Um, as you can see is they have two-car garages, and they have very little room for us to, um, to put snow. What we're trying to do here is maximize our effort if you take a look with the light, the street light where it says 25 miles an hour, what we're doing is we're pulling through all these driveways with a blade, with a gate down, trying to hold as best we can. They'll actually change the mow board position to hold as much snow as they can. And when we get to that, that one grassy spot, we'll try to dump as much as we can, even to the point where we maybe maneuver a little bit to uh, push a little bit more in there, and then we'll go to the next set and 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 grab those. Again. By challenges, I don't want to make it negative. We can make it. We can make it work here. It's just that we change the way we operate coming through these neighborhoods to allow us to try to minimize the amount of snow that 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 is going in their driveways. An interesting concept that Coeur d'Alene Idaho has done is they don't clear the entire driveway. They provide a space big enough for one and a half vehicles. If you had a three-car garage, they they allow a room for one and a half vehicles because they run into storage issues. And uh, a point of interest I'll just bring up, in the last two and a half weeks, I've talked to Moscow, Idaho, Cochrane, Ontario, Canada, Green Bay, Wisconsin, Mandan, North Dakota, and I'm doing a peer review of Minot snow operations um, because of, of information that they read about Sioux Falls. With that, what I'd like to do is show you this video. Not many of us have the opportunity to sit in a motor grader uh, because they only have one seat belt. And if we hit a raised, a raised a, a manhole cover, um, I'll put you right through the windshield, guaranteed. Um, so I have one person in this room that runs a motor grader, and that's Matthew Shepard behind me. He's the one that's in this video. And I'm going to show this video uh, well, what it looks like. The, the Now, before Mark starts this, I want to just explain this a little bit. There is a GoPro camera in the, in the right-hand middle box that's pointed forward, that's stationary. In the left-hand box is a stationary GoPro camera that is looking right down at the snow gate. And then Jolene and Nate with Mud Mile, they're sitting right over here. Jolene, you want to shake your show? Raise your hand. They provided us with a 360 camera, which basically is looking not only at Matt, and, but also taking a look at the sides, and you can take a look at the, at the forward. Now, this gets a little bit dizzy, quirky when you look at it, but I can give you this uh, video to downplay on your smartphones if you want to. What I would ask you to do is watch Matt's hands as this video goes. It's three minutes long, and I'll try to narrate through it.
Um, I turned the music up, but he listens to music that I don't care to listen to, so. He's going along. His left hand is running the snow gate. And um, as he's coming through into this area, um, you can see that he's approaching a vehicle um, up in the upper left-hand side. Left, or left-hand side, you can see there's a vehicle coming. He's also coming to some uh, uh, driveways here. Um, as he comes to the driveway, you can see him throw the gate down. We had a really good push. Snow gates worked excellent in five to six inches of snow that we had. I have, this is the first time that I've had relatively, I had two calls. And one was just basically snow in front of a mailbox, and the other one was because a car was parked in front of the driveway and there's some snow left in the, in the driveway from the snow gate. Two calls and five to six inches of snow. First time ever. Again, take a look at it. There's just crumbs that are left in the driveway. You could do that with one small pass with a, with a, with a shovel. Again, he is the trailing motor grader. He runs the curb. His partner is up ahead of him. Um, again, sometimes they get separated. People have uh, mistake the fact that they see a motor grader and then um, um, they think that we didn't use snow gates. He's coming along. Now again, if you watch his hand movements, his right hand is running the mold board and articulating the snow. You know, look, he doesn't have his hands on the steering wheel. He's running the, the, uh, mo uh, the uh, snow gate with his left, uh, running the mold board and the articulation of the motor grader with his right hand. Uh, he'll reach up every once in a while and grab the, the steering wheel. He does have the ability to do somewhat steering with the joysticks, uh, but basically he's doing his operations right there and, um, and taking a look at what's ahead of him. Also, when he comes up to mailboxes and uh, to trees, uh, there's a couple of the, the pictures here show a tree that's very close to, to, to the mole board, and he's got to watch to make sure when the gate's up that he doesn't hit the, any of those low-hanging branches. This was a pretty good snow for us in the fact that um, uh, driveways were quite visible for us. Uh, sometimes with the heavier snows, you, you don't know where the driveway, you don't know if a three-car garage has a three-car width driveway or a two-car width driveway, and you're trying to guess when to put the gate down. Here's a cul-de-sac. Here's his partner coming. See on the left-hand side? His partner has made one sweep through. Matt's going to run the inside curb. The rest of it's going to be, they're going to back up and they'll pull back up and pull, and they'll come through and out of the cul-de-sac. Matt will clean up the cul-de-sac, and uh, Doug Dykstra, his partner, they've been partners for 15 years. Um, he will be down the street by the time Matt gets done with that cul-de-sac. He's down the street, um, and that's, that's all in the process of trying to get the, the snow bladed out of the city. So again, this is right at the end here. We're going to be done here pretty quick. I just wanted to show you him coming around these, these, this bulb with the cul-de-sac. I had one gentleman that actually, I was following the motor graders here, uh, Jolene and, and Brad Dumpke. Uh, he's with, with uh, CityLink. He's the one that got me the cameras put together. Knows Jolene and me. So thanks, Brad, again, for what you did. Um, I think this is an interesting way for you to realize and to take a look and see what it is that, that, that the motor graders are operating and how to, how to make these uh, work and how we do a snow removal process. Thank you. Uh, so with that, I'll open it up for questions. Again, I'd like to thank Jolene and Nate with Mud Mile and Brad from CityLink with the, for the cameras. We're certainly looking to um, use this again. Um, it's not only good training for us to take a look at, um, but it's also interesting for anybody else to take a look at, too. So I'd open that up for questions. Thank you, Galen. Okay, questions. Councilor Erpenbach? Yeah, thank you, Galen. That's pretty exciting stuff. Thanks for letting them take the cameras with you, too. That's very cool. Um, first question is, where will the video be? Is it going to be on CityLink, I, I, I assume? But um, are, how can we see it as the public? Can we just watch it? I, what we're going to do is it'll probably go underneath uh, SiouxFalls.org backslash snow, and it'll make it available. i got to talk to Brad. Brad's, Brad and IT know how to embed that. In fact, yeah. I didn't do this. They did it for me here. So again, we're going to put that out there. Um, we can send it to each one of you so you can have it on your on your cell phones, um, smartphones, but we're trying to get that out for the public to see also. Right. So then we'll all get goggles too. Actually, actually that, right? what's really interesting, if you have a Samsung phone, because it's a 360 camera, if you move like this, you'll be taking a look at the house. If you move like this, you'll be taking a look at the street. For some, for some reason, it doesn't work on iPhones. Uh, but on Matt's cell, uh, Samsung, he can go like this, and it's like those virtual, you know, you put the 
strap the goggles on, you're going like this and you're looking around. That's the way it, that's the way it operates. You can actually move it around, but I didn't get it. I can't get that to work on my iPhone. Yeah. Um, question then about the um, the concept of plowbacks. When I talk with citizens about that, there are many of them just dumbfounded. What you can call and have? Can you explain what qualifies for a plowback and who might, if I need to have a plowback done, who would I call? Um, you can you can call us three six seven eight two five five. Um, call us uh, 24 hours a day. We'll, we'll do plowbacks. Plowbacks is basically means there is something out in the street that impeded us from from getting the snow pushed to the curb, um, and we had to go around it. So now there's a windrow setting out there, and if if you leave the windrow out there, it's kind of tough for the neighborhood to drive because it gets rutted and icy, and, and you and you go over it, and they don't like that. So if the once the vehicle is moved, if they let us know, we'll come back and plow that back. So um, that's the basically the process, the premise behind a plowback, and um, we don't stop when there's a vehicle there. Uh, police will go through and ticket, uh, but we don't stop for these vehicles and wait. And in, 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 in zone three, in zone two, and zone three, they give them like 24 hours before they'll go out to start towing these. Um, so again, we don't wait for it. We just go th through and we want to get the bulk of the town plowed out, and then we'll go back and do these plowbacks. Cool. Okay. One more, Mr. Chair, if yes. I could. Um, could you talk, Galen, just a little bit about the street narrowing? Are you seeing that happening more in when we have more snowfall? Are, are, is that part of the struggle with getting closer to the curb, or can you talk about that? The narrowing usually occurs when I, when I get uh, uh, several snow events that don't melt. Um, you don't see narrowing in November. You may not see narrowing in December. Um, we, had, we had one year in the test case where we had seen narrowing where we had snow in November, and then it we didn't melt for us. And we actually had to go um, Jefferson Elementary School. I got contacted by the principal and by the resource officers that it was so, it was so dangerous there that if we didn't do something, we we're going to endanger children. And so we actually went in and picked up that two block area by Jefferson Elementary School. Now, that's very expensive to do. And I don't think the city has the budget to go in and pick up residential streets. But certainly that is something that North Dakota has talked to me about. Um, um, you know, I talked to the National Weather Service more than my wife. I talked to the North Dakota about the second most mm -hmm. uh, of anybody because they have so much experience with it. Right. Um, it's, it's so it's it's so it's real informational for me to learn from those guys where they're having issues, where what what they're doing about them, and then how we can work with them down here. So um, again, that that narrowing is something that we haven't seen in the three years that I've had them so far. Um, but again, one of these years we're going to get this snow in November, and it's going to be there till March, and then and then we'll see it, and then we'll have to work with it. We'll deal with it somehow. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. you. Councilor Knight, sir. I have a handful, so I'll just ask a few and then defer. Um, first of all, I want to say related to plowbacks and other service, and this is no disrespect to other city departments, but Public Works is top notch when it comes to responding. Whenever I've called. Director Cotter or I've called 8255 on behalf of a citizen Invariably within an hour or two they're out there and I get this you know amazing email or call saying I cannot believe You did it that fast. I mean they figured maybe in a couple of days Somebody will show up, but so I, I just want to thank you for that. Thank you very much for that comment We are citizens in Sioux Falls, too, and I always tell my crew um, act like you were the one making your request and how soon would you want that request to be done? So I think that's the way they basically follow. Thank you though. Great, okay. Um, are the same people, uh, um, so you have 20 zones, is that? 20, 20 zones that we have routes in them and what we try to do is keep the same people in the routes because they become familiar with it. It's easy for them to know um, the roads and any place where they have some, may have some issues, um, they come very familiar, they know how to do it. They get to know the citizens. They actually have citizens that will stop and talk with them. And so they get to know the people. So um, that's a very, very, very valuable for us. We don't have that all the time. There's always usually some new people out of those 200 city employees that are coming in that are brand new. And um, so we try to train them with some of our more experienced people. But again, um, we try to always keep them in the same snow district so they get to know the streets. Yeah, that, that's what I was getting at. That's that's great. Um, so, just just for myself or others, what is it helpful for your operators if you you know those little orange little poles? If you were to put those out at the street to kind of give visual cues of the beginning and end of my driveway, does that help or no? 
I'm getting you know, kind of anytime we can mind. identify where those are at, um, that would be great. Um, I don't know how well they'll stay there all winter long, but certainly if we know where the driveway starts and where it ends, that helps us out a lot as far as when to put the gate down and when to lift, lift the gate up. Okay, and could, could you just explain to me, sometimes I do have citizens call and say, I, I'm on an emergency snow route, I don't understand why this happened or this didn't, and then I find out it's a secondary snow route. I, I'm still not entirely clear the difference between a snow route an emergency snow route and a secondary okay. snow route? Um, the emergency snow routes are basically our arterial collectors, five lanes, uh, the big ones. That's Everything comes in and out. Then we also have a group of um, secondary snow routes. What we like to do is, is say that a citizen lives in a location, only has to drive like maybe eight to ten blocks to get to a secondary, which is then cleared to get to an emergency so that they're not having to, mm -hmm. to struggle through to an emergency, just an emergency. And I think Mark is pulling it up here. We've got it on our webpage. Um, but it's, it's to help us to get traffic to and from work or to and from a business. And so we've set these up in town. We, we're very careful um, what these, what, what's declared a, in an emergency snow route or what's declared a secondary. If we dilute it too much, we basically eliminated the whole process of what an emergency snow out. These are the streets that we concentrate on during a de-icing event, and these are the only streets we concentrate on a de-icing event, a non-snow event area. And again, these are based on routes for people to get to, um, to work a little bit easier, or from work, or to a business and back home again, to school and back. Um, one of the things that's not listed on here is every time we have a de-icing event, we also go around the schools. Um, we, we feel this is something that that, that we've worked with the school district on very closely on. We feel it's very important that kids get, are safely dropped off and safely picked up. So we try to de-ice around those schools so that there's no incidents for those kids that are going to school. So we work very closely with all the schools, both public and parochial in town, that uh, when I say we've, we've gotten, take, we've de-iced, we went out and did a de-icing event, that means schools got touched also. Jeff Kreider and, and I uh, talk quite a bit during the, during the winter season. Okay, and the last one for now is the, um, and thank you, is um, if you just do the emergency snow routes, does that include the secondaries Pardon or me? not? If you, just, if you just do, you don't do a full snow alert and you, go just, and you just do emergency snow routes, does that include the secondaries? Does that make in sense? A, in a snow, in, when we're in the snow alert, what we do is we do the emergencies, we go in and do the secondaries, we do the schools, and then we jump into zone three, which is the, which is the residential. So the secondaries are treated before the residential streets are because again, we, when you wake up in the morning, where, where you live, we want you to be able to travel eight to 10 blocks and hit a secondary that can get you to an emergency snow route so you're not worried about getting stuck. Okay, thank you. Council oh, the map. The map shows the reds are the emergency snow routes and the blues are the secondary snow routes. And again, this is on uh, SiouxFalls.org backslash snow, and then you can go in there, and they actually have the emergency secondary routes listed here. Again, every fall, mm -hmm. we go through and take a look at streets that may qualify for emergency snow routes or designation or um, secondary snow route designation. We have, the city is growing that we have to add, usually every fall we add to this list. And then the emergency snow routes are posted uh, Heath Hoff Teaser, the traffic engineer, has his traffic maintenance team go out and post those emergency snow routes so that anytime over snow inch, two inches, those people have to move their vehicles on, even if it's just a de icing event, if it's over two inches. Okay, Councillor Staley. Well, I'm, I'm going to um, have to echo what Councillor Neitzer said about Mark Cotter. He has been fabulous. Thank you so much. Uh, especially those first snowfalls we had, I did get calls from people who had concerns about icy streets. And Galen, you were right there too. You guys went right out and addressed the issue. So thank you so much for that. And um, I didn't realize that last winter was the fifth snowiest winter on record. And I will say that I heard, the year before I heard from people as well, I mean, they're calling me, and they, Last year, there was rave reviews about the service on snow gates. And this last event we just had, I got calls from people saying they were very, very pleased with how it went. Um, I also talked with the mayor from Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, Idaho, when we were doing the petition drive. And um, 
I think that when you were showing that video about the driveways, I, how I don't know how that would look, but I, I think that would be reasonable to say we're going to do, you know, one and a half lengths or, you I know. Think that would be great. Um, I would need council support on that because anytime we reduce the amount of width in the driveway, um, I, I hear about it. I had one of the two calls that I had was a, a driveway that didn't, wasn't completely clean. And I walked, talked to, walked to, through the gentleman and he says, I, I just, it's heavy, it's wet, I, I, I have back issues. I don't think that you guys did a very good job. And after talking to him, I found out that there was a car in the way. And with a car in the way, we can only grab so much sure. of the snow. And, and, and again, if the car gets moved, we can come back and do a plowback on that. Well, and, and I think that, the, well, it was very good to see those driveways because when you, it's mostly cement. So you really don't have any place to drop it. Um, so that's something that I, I would agree with. And then also, Councillor Neitzert was talking about a poll. Of why couldn't we do a kind of a promotional thing in the fall to say to homeowners, if whatever the length of the driveway would be, what we would, but having maybe they could put something, have some, a standard thing that they put in the ground that would be helpful to your drivers I, too. You know, I think I think that um, that was what's that. Yeah, I th I th again, I think, um, you know, I, I'm not sure how well they'll stay up there if they'll stay there all winter long, but I know that operators have said it's really tough during the night when it's snowing or when it's when it's dark out. I shouldn't say snowing. We're clearing the residential streets to see where that driveway is. I mean, you're looking at the garage. You're kind of looking down, and it's all white. Okay, where does that apron begin, and mm -hmm. where does it end when I get? If there's a mailbox there, you usually can figure out where it ends. But you don't necessarily know that, especially with three-car garages. You don't know if it's a three-car width right. or a two-car width when right. it's coming right. through. And let me also say there was some discussion. I did write a letter to the editor two weeks ago, and in the midst of writing that letter, um, I discovered that we do not have a, a written ordinance uh, about the snow gates which was my intent as leading that petition drive that we would have that in writing. So our attorney, David Fifley has, I just, he emailed me just now, but we are going to be getting that ordinance written into the, American Legal is gonna put that down for us. So it'll be something physically that somebody could look up. I didn't realize that either. Um, I can guarantee you that we'll use them every snow alert. That's, that's your promise from me. Okay, back to you, Councillor Neitzer. And just a couple quick follow-ups. Uh, contractors, do they, do they, does everybody get a standardized training of snow gates, uh, the same as a city employee? How, how does that look? They certainly have the opportunity if they want to. We usually put about five snow schools on each fall. They, we've invited them to that and asked them to participate if they have new employees in that, in that, um, in that arena, um, that they can come in and do the same thing. Pushing, pushing gravel isn't the same thing as pushing snow, but it still gives you the feel of that, that operating that lever. And that gate's not, as you notice, that's, that gate doesn't slam down. It, it comes down. So you gotta get used to that timing. As you're coming up to that driveway apron, you gotta put the timing so that that gate closes just as you're coming in. And I'll tell you that the mole board, the way they're mounted, the mole board isn't at the optimum cutting. And you'll notice that a snow gate, a plow with a snow gate on, is letting snow go underneath because it can't cut. To order to make it the optimum cutting at the mold board, the snow gate would have to be like this and there'd be snow going underneath. So we're, we're changing the way we plow with the, with the snow gate to allow us to get that snow gate flat on the surface. I wanna trap everything in that surface, but I may not be cutting that, that as much as I want to. But because of that, I usually have a sander right behind it. And if we see that the sander is putting down chemical behind that or sand in a residential area to accommodate the fact that we are still letting a little bit of snow in there. Okay. Um, and I, I will say, I, I have one other thing, but I will say I happen to park in the third stall, so I'm not sure I'm excited about the idea of <laughs> narrowing the. So that's just because then the pile is going to be in front of where I, I can back clear up. clear yours instead of the other one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, my wife would probably dispute that. But um, so. How much does it cost for a snow alert? And I think it's per inch. Is that kind of how I calculate it? There, I have a rule of thumb. And, and basically, it's based on historic data that I have when collecting information. And it runs about $140,000 an inch when I call a snow alert. OK. OK. And so obviously, wow. there's a lot of tax dollars involved. So it's always kind of a trying to balance giving good service with 
being prudent with taxpayer dollars and calling that alert? You know, certainly last year in 2016, the fiscal year 2016, mm -hmm. and I had three, six, five events over 3.5 inches that we basically only plow the emergencies and secondaries, I put chemical down, but left the residentials. Again, let me tell you, safety is the primary uh, goal of the streets. And I make sure that first of all, safety is, I, Mark and I talk a lot. Um, and, and we take a look at that and then I tell them about the weather. I got 350 degree days or 250 degree days coming in. Um, and every time we've done this in 16, I contacted the police department and we did not see an increase of accidents during that time frame from when um, the snow hit the ground to the point where it had melted it off the street. So um, I'm feeling pretty good about those calls that we're making that those were right calls. And if you leave 6.2 inches of snow melt, uh, multiply that times 140,000, see what the taxpayers have got saved on that. So that's an important number for us. And one other point that I'd like to make, excuse me, Councilor, I don't want to, uh, if you have another question, I just want to make a point before I forget. You, you, all of you take calls from people about how we operate our snow gates or our snow, snow operations. Please tell them to contact us. We will come out and take a look at them. That's the best way I can take it, that I can do it. Um, in January, we, there were some calls for some people that um, maybe actually had a gentleman that showed up and said that we didn't use snow gates. As soon as I heard that on Tuesday, I was out, took a look at his place. Unfortunately, it was like two weeks later, and we had 40 to 50 degree weather. There's a remnant of snow. I can't tell what we did up there. Um, it's a very narrow streets. And what happens on narrow streets, the, the, the lead plow comes in, and that windrow is right beside the driveway. But the second plow comes in and takes that with it. And whether or not he's seen the second plow or not, I'm not sure. I don't know for sure. I can't tell you. But I can tell you that um, in a normal snow alert, in 24 hours, we take 500 phone calls down to street division. Of those 500 phone calls, I get the, the bad ones. That's usually about 50. That's what I received in January. It took 50 phone calls from people that were very upset. Of those 50, approximately 20 of them had to deal with snow gates, of which I went out and took a look at personally. Of those 20 that I went out and took a look at, there was two locations that I couldn't determine whether or not we use snow gates. I, I, I gave it to the property owner and sent a motor grader there and cleaned it. If you can send those to me so I know those addresses and those contacts, we will personally go out there and, and the sooner I see it, the better I can determine whether or not it was, um, was, was we were used. I'll give you one example. I was following Matt on Friday and we were over on Melanie, over in that area, uh, 30, 28th in that area. He put down his snow gate. I was 30 feet behind him. He put down his snow gate, and the snow was wet, so it rolled like snowballs. Great snowball. It rolled like snowballs. And when the gate went down, he rolled these snowballs into the driveway, the height of the, the <coughs> windrow. If this guy would have called me and I wouldn't have seen it, I went there and said, we mustn't have used snow gates. I'll come in there and clear that out. He used a snow gate. It was just that much snow and the consistency of that very wet snow that rolled it around that snow gate and it put it this high in his driveway all the way across. And um, that, a lot of times that's what we take a look at is we take a look at down the street, what's the level of the snow in the driveway versus the level of snow in the rest of the, the rest of the parking strip and make a determination if we used a snow gate or not. We are human. Do we miss a, a, a driveway during a snow ban? I would say there's a pretty good chance that we miss a driveway. We try to rectify that by going back. If they call us, we'll come that back there and do it. If I see a location where we use a snow gate, what I'll do is I'll educate the person on how, why it is that I believe we used a snow gate. I'll send a motor grader and take it out. This is too much fun. One more. Um, so you can come and talk to me. No, this is no, good stuff. No, no. Um, so when, uh, as an example for me, um, and, and I have citizens ask me, but I'll give you an example just personalizing it. And trust me, this is not a complaint or anything. But uh, So I have a three-stall driveway, and it just so happens that the mailboxes are, are on, the, on the far side of it. So you've got that, um, you know, you get that snow gate down, and then you go by past my driveway. Do they... Do they lift it right in front of the mailbox? Do they try to hold off? Is it a judgment call for each one? Is there a policy? Um, and other up, people ask me this. Up until this year, we, we, as soon as we got to the end of the driveway, we opened the gate. I'm trying to get rid of the snow in the driveway, and I'm trying to store as much snow as I can in the parking strip. And so it happens that a lot of the mailboxes are on the down traffic side of your, of your driveway. If all the mailboxes were on the up traffic side, we wouldn't have a problem, but they're on the, most of them are on the downhill side. And so when we've opened the gate as soon as we 
have gone through a driveway because we're gonna get rid of that snow and I'm trying to store it. Last two, January and February snowstorms, we've tried to pull past the, 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 the mo uh, mailboxes. And um, I'll take 50 calls next snowstorm that I didn't go past our mailbox. We try to do it as best we can. Am I gonna, am I gonna drop snow in front of your mailbox? Yes, I probably will. But we're also experimenting and trying to pull it through, especially in a five, six. I'll tell you what, a four to six inch snowstorm, snow gates, I'll, I'll make those things sing, just like this one. Um, anything above seven, we have challenges, and I'll still make them work. Okay, great, thank you. I, I'd love to see that 19 inch snowstorm we had in 2009. I'd like to see what snow gates would do that. That was, that was a dry snow, see what they do with that. <laughs> Councilor hey, Staley. Um, uh, well, first of all, Galen, I did get a call from the man who pu gave public testimony about the snow okay. gates. He called me. He was thrilled last last week. So, great serve. Yeah, he was very happy. We we are actually. I asked my supervisors there at four street supervisor and, and myself. Uh, we try to go out during the snow event and uh, do quality control, just like any business would do. We do Good. quality control and try to see. Um, go into areas where we know we've had some calls before, see what we're doing there to make sure we're doing it right. And then, Mark Cotter, one more thing for you. you. We had a conversation. I just would like you to say this to the council. I asked you about, um, we talked about how much longer it takes with snow gates, and you said 10% or less. What, uh, well, let me add with that. You know, during the, during the uh, testing, it, we found out it would take us a little bit longer, not significant, but a little bit longer to do it with the amount of the equipment that we had, or what we could do is add equipment and we could do it for the same amount of time. Um, we've added eight more additional motor graders. I think that is why we are able to do it within that 23 hours. I think that's a nice service. A lot of the calls I took from uh, Green Bay, Mandan, and Moscow was they're getting beat up because it's taken them so long to clear out their city. Um, um, uh, Minot said it took them 72 hours to clear 1,200 lane miles, and they were just getting beat up. So they have a committee that's being formed right now to take a look at what it is, and that's why I'm doing the peer review of their snow plan for them. So we added equipment, and I think that's a good service. I think that's a tolerable amount of time for our citizens. Um, and it just so happened at work that the snow was during the middle of the night, and we were able to get secondaries, for, for emergency secondaries and schools done before people even got up. So I think that was good. If it snows during the day and it's a work day, um, we get tangled up with the traffic and we usually take a lot more calls, but this one was a good snow. We pushed, we had a good push. Probably the best in 11 years that I was here. Okay, uh, Councilor uh, Selberg. Well, I waited too long because most of my questions and compliments have been exhausted here, but I did want to add that in this position, this particular subject I really found fascinating learning more about it because I think a lot of people out there don't really have an idea what all goes into it and I found out I was one of them but um, I would just again echo the main thing is to say I appreciate how you both go about your job and I just enjoy your passion you make me want to go shovel you're just ready to go um, but every time I've got a, anybody that's got a compliment or a compliment complaint or whatever it might be We relay it to you and a quick response and everybody seems they're walking away happy No matter how grumpy they might have been when they came in so I appreciate what you do. Thank you I actually went out to Erica and looked at it this morning at 1030 um, that eyebrow It's an eyebrow and I can talk to you about that that the citizen that had a uh, issue so Okay, well, uh, gentlemen, thank you very much for uh, the report. It was a great report. Uh, appreciate your enthusiasm and your thoroughness. Uh, and Matt, uh, I compliment you on, uh, on the great job that you do uh, and, and the performance for the citizens of Sioux Falls. So Matt, thank you very much. That's amazing. I mean, I have a hard time uh, chewing gum and dribbling a basketball at the same time, so I, I don't think I could do your job. No, no way could I do it. Uh, I would be relocating parked cars and mailboxes. But um, so thank you very much. That was the last item on our agenda, so this meeting is adjourned.